This book discusses the JPA theory of freedom. Um, and the connection between that theory of freedom and an argument for basic income. What I argue in this book is that we need a, a better theory of status freedom. Everyone uses freedom in two different ways. To say, I'm a free person. I'm a free person. If you get out of jail, you say, he, uh, you got your freedom. If you're arrested, you say, you lost your freedom. If you were a slave, you lost your freedom. If you're, they, you stop being a slave, you are free. People in an oppressed country, unfree. People who end the oppression have freed themselves. We have this status conception of freedom. But of course, we also have this uh, sort of a, what they would call a scalar or a, a measure of freedom, which is a weird English word. The other word for it is continuous, which is which sounds like something else. So I'll go with scalar. What scalar means is like you can measure it on a scale. You can get a little more, a little less. So the status one is you're free or you're not, this or that. Uh, whereas the, the, the scalar idea is how much freedom do you have? You know, it's something you can measure, you get more, how much freedom do you have? Most theories of freedom are theories of the scalar freedom. How much theory, how much freedom do you have? What it means to be a free person, I argue in the book, is an under-theorized idea. We have very few true theories of status freedom. The closest thing we have to one is a Republican idea of freedom as non-domination. But as I argue in the book, it's not really always truly a theory of, of status freedom. It's also used in this scalar sense. Uh, and so I'm trying to come up with a theory of status freedom. And, 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 it, and, and the one that I have connects very much to what to me is the core argument for basic income. Uh, so the theory of freedom that I propose in this book, I call effective control self-ownership, e, which is abbreviated E-C-S-O pronounced EXO, uh, and uh, ECSO, Effective Control Self-Ownership. And usually, whenever I use it, I, I just to stress what it is, EXO freedom, ECSO freedom. And I do that because, because it is connected to what it sounds like. When you say EXO freedom, it sounds like EXO freedom, which means, which, of course, EXO is an English prefix meaning external, you know, exoskeleton, uh, exoplanets, things outside. What I mean by exo-freedom is your status relative to other people. It is, you're, you're free in the sense that no one else is oppressing you. Um, and uh, so not, and because some other theories that are trying to get toward a theory of status freedom will talk about being free, not only from external constraints, but internal constraints, being a fully autonomous person who isn't, uh, who isn't uh, hampered by misunderstanding the life that they're leading or, mis or, 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 or values that are counterproductive to what they, they really want. Uh, and those issues, those internal issues, what makes a mature person, what makes a person who makes good decisions that are truly in their own benefit, those issues I don't wanna deal with. All what I want is a person who's free from oppression by other people. Of course, that could be effective. People could be oppressing you by giving you these awful ideas, but that's not something I'm dealing with. Okay, now, what effective control self-ownership is, is both a narrowing and a broadening of a sense of self-ownership. Ownership in philosophy is now the standard treatment of ownership is won by Tony Honoré which came out, I think, in the 1970s, maybe 80 in the 70s. So it's about, I think it's around 50 years old. Um, 
Tony Honoré, who, who identifies 11 different rights and duties that, that go along with what it means to own something. If you have these 11 incidents of ownership, you own something in the sense that it's understood in our society. Now, if you read anthropology, which I do, you find the concepts of ownership are actually can be pretty different than that in other societies. But in our society, um, which is basically everywhere colonialists have, uh, have perpetrated this idea of full liberal ownership, which is most of the world, um, this is how ownership is understood. It's these 11 rights and duties don't need to go over all of them. Several of these have to do with control aspects. Uh, about half of them have to do with what it, what it means to have control over an object, a piece of property, that you get to decide what happens to it, you, you, you get to decide where it goes, the, these sorts of issues. The control aspects of self of ownership are saying, I'm saying that's what's really core about these other, some other things about the right to earn income from something. Well, that's, that's a little more peripheral, things like that. Um, uh, the the, the uh, things, uh, the freedom from creditors, things like that. These other things are less important. The core of what of of owning something to me is control of it. However, the control has to be effective. But self ownership, people offer this really broad idea of self ownership. Oh, we want to make sure you own all eleven rights and duties of yourself. That you're no one's slave because you fully own yourself but they make it ineffective. A lot of right libertarians do this. Well, we should say everybody owns themselves, but nobody, uh, but most people don't own any external assets. External assets are all the assets in the world external to any human body. So natural resources, but also the consumption goods and capital that we make out of natural resources. Those are external assets. A human being, who fully and completely owns themselves, but has no ownership of any external assets, really has no effective control of themselves at all. Because humans are not, are not uh, imaginary game pieces, uh, and they're not machines either. Uh, humans are organic beings that need that need energy to survive. They have physical needs. They need food, shelter, clothing, companionship, and other things like that to survive. Access to other people, the, the access to other people, the ability to make agreements to other people, freedom of movement. If we are unable to meet our needs, we will be effectively under the control of whoever controls the resources capable of meeting our needs. And I, uh, you can say, well, if one person owes all the resources, we're that person's slave. But all the, if, if different people own them, well, we're not the slave of any one of them. But we have to end up doing things for some of those people. And Michael Otsuka, a uh, great philosopher, uh, a great philosopher in London, Michael Otsuka, uh, talks about what he calls robust libertarian self-ownership. And not only the right to own yourself, but the right to the right of access to the resources you need to make sure you own yourself. Then your self-ownership is robust, he calls it. Or I would say instead of robust, I say effective. Um, and so, so I've narrowed self-ownership to the control aspects, but expanded it to include this effectiveness. And that's how I get effective control self-ownership. And argue that when you lack effective control self-ownership, you are certainly an impressed person. That this is one of the things that you need to free yourself from oppression. Destitution is unfreedom. This excellent article by Jeremy Waldron, Homelessness and the Issue of Freedom. Uh, 
which is on the syllabus and I very highly recommend it, um, argues that homeless people are unfree in the most liberal negative sense of the world, of the word. Wherever they go, they are interfered with. They are unfree to sleep undisturbed. They're unfree to wash themselves, unfree to find a private place to urinate. Um, and, and he has this whole list of very basic bodily functions that people are, are, are human needs that they're, they're unfree. They're unfree to do unfettered. And one thing that he doesn't say in that article that I add to the list is they're unfree to use the resources of the earth to meet their own needs. And most of us are in that position where we can't, we do not have access to enough resources of the earth to keep ourselves alive without, without working for, that is being a servant of, serving the interests of somebody with enough property to give us a job. And even if you're an independent contractor, you can say, oh, I'm gonna be an independent contractor and I'm only gonna provide services for other poor people like me. Well, if they're really poor, if they're completely destitute, you get nothing from serving them. You can serve low income people, but not completely destitute people. And even if you do say, okay, I'm just gonna serve low income people, You've, you've got to find a place to sleep. So some of your efforts are going to go to a landlord. You're going to need tools. And, and whatever tools, you know, you're going to need to eat stuff. Um, all of that stuff is going to go to people who own the resources of the earth that we make the things we need out of. Your responsibility as a human being on this planet is to provide enough services for the people who own the resources and the capital that we make out of resources to keep yourself alive. If you then want to go and help people who are actually genuinely in need, you can, that's optional. But the one thing that's mandatory, the one thing we all need to do is to serve the people who already have. We are, it's like being born in debt. Uh, that that I'm, I'm born having less and therefore I have to give something to the people who have more. I've got to go and work for them to get them to, to share what they have with me. They have no responsibility to share with me unless I provide a service that they need. And that's because they own the earth. Well, nobody naturally owns the earth. And if we are going to make the earth into property, the first thing we ought to do is not create the situation of dependence, not to create the situation where this group of people has to provide services for that group of people. If we were all providing services for each other, that might be different. But when this group of people has to find at least one person from that group who provides services for them, you have an unfree situation. That is the, the, the essence of it. Now, there were people who would say, well, work is a fact of nature. Um, that, uh, that work is a fact of nature. Of course, everybody, as long as there have been humans on this planet, people have had to work to survive. You want to free them from that. That's nothing that that argument is an equivocation. It re relies on equivocation of using the word work in two different ways. Destitution is not a fact of nature. It is a result of the way society has chosen to establish property rights over resources. Uh, for millions of years, our ancestors were free to meet their own needs without interference with anyone, without following anyone's orders, without having to find a landlord and doing something for them, without having to find a boss and doing something again, without having to find a client and doing something again. They could hunt, gather, fish, and farm, or start their own cooperative or their own business with whoever they wanted to, if they so choose. And some people in the world still have this option. And this is not some uh, this is not some distant idea that I'm talking about. My grandfather had this freedom. My grandfather on a farm in Indiana was fully capable of growing, growing a balance that once he had his house paid off, he was uh, 
his house and his farm paid off. He was fully capable. He was a good farmer who did different things. He had lamb and he had chickens and he had, uh, he could grow a, a varied diet in his, uh, on his fields and he can, and he did when he needed to, grew what he wanted. I ate his lamb. I got so sick of all that. Oh, organic farm to table lamb again. I got so sick of that as a kid. But, uh, and his own chickens, his own eggs. He and my grandmother could do this if and when they wanted to. When they worked for other people, it was because they chose. My friend Abdul Rahman, his grandfather, who is a herder in Somalia, has the same freedom. But this freedom has been taken away from both of us. Those people, for them, work means using effort to turn goods into consumption. And in that sense, that kind of work, yes, that is a fact of life. But work in the sense of going into a job and obeying orders from a boss or going and finding clients and saying, what can I do to get you to give me some money so I can give it to a landlord uh, to, so that I can find a place to sleep, that kind of work is not a fact of nature. Uh, we have taken these freedoms from the poorest people in our societies and given them no com compensation in return. And what we've created is a worker starve situation. Individuals are forced into a state of propertyless where they cannot work for themselves and they cannot work for other people like them. A million homeless people, if they all said, okay, we all care about each other. We want to. Work. We love working for other humans. We want to work for all the other million homeless people like us. Cannot do it because it would all starve. None of them owns the land on which they could build a house, grow their plants. It is. We do not have a circle of obligation where everybody in our society has to work for each other. What we have is a hierarchical obligation where all of us have to work for the people at the top or closer. And, and what little we do, we have to at least do some benefit. In your life, you must provide enough services for a landlord to get yourself a place to sleep. In your life, you have to provide enough services for the people who own resources to get the things you need to make your daily bread. Once you do that, your responsibility to the rest of society is done. Serving those privileged people is all you have to do. Any, any services you provide for other people is optional. And we're in the position where if you don't do that, you will be homeless, you will be hungry, and eventually you will starve. Unless you can find, say, uh, a, say a, a, a place to set up your tent, a, a bridge to sleep under, or a, and a dumpster to eat out of. The legal means to survive is get the owners to give you access to the resources you need. You can work for them. Marry one of them, bake from them. Those are your choices. For most of us, this is going to mean work or stop. Uh, so today, it's illegal for people to work just for themselves. Uh, and working eventually means working for property owners. It can be indirect, but some of the benefit of your effort is going to go to that landlord uh, or someone else who owns other types of property. Uh, forced for, and, 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 and people will look at the society and call it freedom. This is not freedom, where one group takes control of the earth, interferes with everybody else's efforts that they might want to use to mix their labor with the land and, and, and uh, betterment for themselves. We all have to work for them. That is not freedom. To look at that and call that uh, I'd call that a free society uh, because we all exercise our property rights is just to stare on freedom in the place and call it freedom. It's uh, up is down, tall is short. Uh, it's, it's very Orwellian to call that freedom. Uh, but what people are so used to doing is this system justifying ideology that natural, but property rights are somehow natural has so evaded our society that we hardly even question this, that we seem to think that this situation where a few people on the earth and the rest of us, oh yeah, working, you're working for them, is just taken as given. Well, it is not given. It was imposed on us, as I talked about in earlier seminars, it was imposed on us by the enclosure movement in Europe and by the colonial movement 
everywhere else. It was imposed on us by a government violent campaign of aggression. Um, forced labor is not freedom. It is not exactly slavery, but a choice of masters is not full freedom either. Sure, it is better to be a wage worker in almost all circumstances than it is to be a chattel slave. But that doesn't mean that you're fully free. And the freed slaves in the United States in 1865 knew this. That's why they asked for 40 acres and a mule. But the former slave owners knew it too. And that's why they took back all those 40 acres and all those mules that they gave everybody. That, well, uh, that the US military was starting to give people. So we need compensation for the fact that we don't all have direct access to resources. And what I argue in the book is that, that compensation should take the form of an unconditional basic income large enough to meet your basic needs so that you don't face the work or starve principle. If you work for other people or for the landlords and the capital owners of the world, if you work for them, it is because you chose to when you had another option, ending this mandatory participation work or starve principle. We restore that, low, that lost power with a basic income. And I argue in the book that this is a much better protection for people than the conventional welfare state that tries to, uh, tries to um, help low-income people, but without challenging this worker star principle. And those kind of things are always going to have problems with them. First of all, you're helping paternalistically. You are helping in a way to say, well, we don't want to free you to tell us when, when the work is no good. We're going to make jobs that are really good for you, and then we're going to tell you you got to take it. Well, you don't tell oppressed people when their oppression is over. They will tell you. You want to build a society without oppression. You make the jobs as good as you can. And then you give the potentially oppressed people of the world the option of whether or not to take it. The option is to say, oh, those jobs still aren't good enough. You failed. You tried, and you failed. Um, the oppressed people of the world will tell you when their oppression is free. You got no business telling the oppressed people of the world that you must work because I have solved your oppression. That is a self-serving form of arrogance. And it's so many of our conventional Left of center theories of justice incorporate this, including, in, including uh, socialist, communist, uh, 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 social contract theories, social democracies, many of them do need uh, something that is both progressive and, and progressive for the least advantage, but it's going to ask as little of them as possible. Offer them opportunities to get involved work and participate, but never use force to bring them in. That's what I argue for in the book, Independence, Profitlessness, and Basic Income, A Theory of Freedom of the Power of Statement. All right, let's discuss it. All right, I've got several people who are interested in discussing this. Okay, so uh, let's see, who's first? Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, who wants to go first? Uh, who is discussing this? Uh, okay, Medha? Yeah, so I'll go first. I'm doing the paper, Why We Demand Universal Basic Income. Okay, and remember to break down what you're saying you know, by points and get the discussion going. Uh, okay. okay um, Unless you only have one point. I, I yeah. kind of have like some criticism and okay. some mm -hmm. like, uh, points. So um, the paper. First of all, it criticizes grant writers' mm -hmm. uh, real freedom for all. And yeah. I think uh, it makes a valid point uh, where it says, criticizes grant writers' uh, notion of freedom that freedom is whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. And the this is the point I like because it, it gives a freer access to resources, but there is no concept of self uh, ownership or self control in grant writers' theory. Mm -hmm. 
then um, the paper also talked about the freedom to access all resources mm -hmm. or, or all resources freely to everyone and having unconditional access to those resources. Now the problem I think here is that if, if everyone has equal access to resources, there might be a fight for ownership of those resources, which I think sort of is inevitable. Um, also, to, uh, how do we control that? How do we control human uh, selfish tendencies is uh, by bringing a sort of authority into power, which again contradicts with the fundamental concept of a stateless uh, society. Mm. What else is there? Um, then you have the, I think the one major point of the paper is the freedom from being exploited. You have the freedom to say no when you do not want to work mm -hmm. and walk out of your job. And um, you know, you have a basic income which empowers you, you to do that. But then, but then the fundamental concept of laziness or unwillingness to work also comes into play there. Um, yeah, I think most of the things, are, it's a very short paper. Mm -hmm. So those mm -hmm. were, if anything else comes up, I'll. Okay, Benedict? Um, do you want to work? <laughs> Do you do you do you have intrinsic motivation to work? Yeah. I have intrinsic motivation to do something with my life. Yeah. But I, I personally, it's a very fundamental. Like you mentioned, you mentioned laziness. Yeah. That would differentiate laziness and unwillingness to work a you know shitty job that you need to take. Yeah. Exactly. Right. I mean, I would I would personally say this is a very you know a very personal issue. I would personally say I. Have, Close to zero intrinsic motivation to you know work just to keep myself afloat. I'm just have, you know intrinsic motivation to do things that interest me. So. But then it's like once you start getting a universal basic income, wouldn't you be like, oh, I have a passion. For example, take me. I have a passion for research, right? But then once you start saying, well, like, oh, why do I need to work? Let it be. Life is short. I'll just stay at home and spend the basic income. It could be like that, and you could. Eventually, you use your intrinsic motivation or your passion to actually work, and you live on that basic income. I mean, I, I, I totally, I, you know, that might apply to some people. I totally get what you're saying, but that's a isn't that a very negative way of looking at you know what constitute like how humans you know once empowered constitute their day. <laughs> It's sort of an, it, it's it a is, very, it's, it's a bit, it's, 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 a, I see a little bit of cynicism in there, yes, is what I'm it, trying to say, you know. It's, 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 it's there, but um, when you, when you, uh, when you see countries like Africa where people do work hard and do not get paid enough, universal basic income becomes inevitable for those countries. As it, you should provide universal basic income to those countries where they're not paid enough. But, uh, countries like Germany, where you are paid enough, should everyone get the universal basic income? Should it be universal per se? Many people in Germany aren't paid enough. And I mean, different countries have differing definitions of what is enough, obviously. Um, well, yeah. Can I get in here? Yes. Um, I say that, that uh, I have. I have, in, in some sense, I, I have an intrinsic motivation to work in the sense of I, I would like to do things that contribute to society, but I have no intrinsic motivation whatsoever to the work in the, in the sense that we really use it, which is to provide services of the people who already own the resources of the world and the capital we make out of them. I have no intrinsic motivation to do this whatsoever, but I've done lots of this throughout my life. Um, and even here, even here at Freebus, where I'm working on basic income all day, I am able to do this because I'm in fact serving the whim of a private property owner who actually has a conscience and supports basic income and his name is Gotts Vanna. And he funds this institute. If it wasn't for him and the fact that he made a lot of money 
and want her to do some good in the world with it, um, I would not be able to be here in doing this sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and when I worked at my regular university, Georgetown University, Qatar, I worked there because there just happens to be a lot of natural gas in Qatar and they can afford to hire a professor. I teach some of the most privileged students in the world at that university because they can pay me to come there. This is what people must do. And that is, is unjust. Now, so now, now, now it's true. If you, if you, now, but your, of course, your point is if people don't have to work, but they lose their motivation to work, even doing the good thing. And my argument against this, which is also in the book that I didn't talk about very much, I'm glad you brought it up, which is that, that one of the things having this freedom to this power to say no is, is that it is a check on the power of everyone else. The people who control the political process have to think about, since we can't make them work like we're doing now, how do we get them to choose work? How do we get them to provide the services? We, we've got to have a labor situation that is going to, get, that is going to make them want to. Uh, maybe more labor rights or something like that. What do they need? Do they need... Do they, need, um, do they need shorter work weeks? Do they need uh, more childcare? What do they need to get them to work? And also, I think the ultimate responsibility is if the resource owners of the world want us to go and provide service for them, they gotta figure out what, what kind of pay and working conditions will get me to work for them. It is their responsibility, it is not the responsibility of the poor and the disadvantaged of the world to work for everybody else. If everybody else benefits from labor, it is their responsibility to provide wages that make people choose to provide that labor. And we've got lots of ways to do it. It's called luxuries. If people have their needs met and you wanted to get them to work, you offer them luxuries or some other motivation. You offer them whatever motivations it takes. And that makes the basic income a check on both the political process and on the uh, and on the economic system. Okay, uh, Dritton had his hand up a minute ago. You still want to talk, Dritton? No, I just wanted to ask a question. But as you were talking, you explained what I. Oh. Wanted. Okay, good. So I'll move on. Okay, Benedict wanted to respond to that, and then you met, uh, and then we'll go on. Um, I just I I want to I want to conclude, you know, or you know. Uh, I would want to encourage Meta to be a bit more optimistic because there's, <laughs> there's, there's considerable evidence. I mean, at least at least in Germany, we do have those professions where we, we can infer that people are there because they want to do good, even though working conditions are atrocious. That's definitely care homes, that's hospitals, you know, in the middle of the pandemic where um, if, if, uh, if nurses in German hospitals were only there for the money, they'd be unionizing by now and demanding demanding much higher pay. And but all of that isn't happening, even though conditions are atrocious. I would make the case that some people are there because they want to. And after universal basic income comes into play, they would still, you know, work for the common good. It's just that they could afford to say no if they. Yeah, if they were absolutely overworked, which definitely, which definitely happens. You know. yeah, um, just putting it out there, it's not a very pessimistic person, actually. <laughs> but then that's what the first take is But then, uh, like uh, the professor said about uh, people can actually do what they wish to do as a uh, work uh, towards something they like, rather than working just for the sake of money. Money. Um, so an interesting thing happens back home in India is that a lot of people are there who are applying for the same job and they get paid a minimum wage which is not enough to even put them through the month even if they live alone. So I think universal basic income would empower those people to ask for a higher wage for the kind of work they do for the insane amounts of hours that they work. Um, 
but then also there is a huge population which needs to be catered to. So do we have the finances for that? And I think we answered that in the beginning of the class that we can tax the super rich and the wealthy people to finance the GBI. So yeah, I think that makes sense to me. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, let's go to uh, Dritan and then Otto. Dritan, you're next. Okay, thank you. Uh, I heard the discussion uh, between Benedict and Meta, and as I see, uh, well, part-time, in case of a UBI scheme, there, the part-time jobs will be extinct. And the economy, and especially small businesses, definitely need part-time jobs. And when you think about a restaurant, for example, uh, who would do the dishes? Who would clean the dishes? In, in that case, it, it's a 1000 euro paying job, let's say, and who would do the dishes for them? Because that might be automated, uh, that, that might be roboticized in, in a sense, but uh, there still has to be someone who puts the dishes in the wash machine or uh, however do you call it. And then uh, I see that, or I anticipate that there could be more big businesses that would, uh, you know, uh, take control of the economy and the economy wouldn't be as dispersed as in case of uh, with part-time jobs or uh, without a UBI scheme. So big businesses would be able to pay more and yeah, they would offer the luxuries uh, to pay us more or work in, uh, you know, way better conditions than previously. But uh, businesses who depend on human capital that don't require, uh, you know, uh, great skills in a particular topic. I was I took as an example a restaurant. Who would do the dishes then? You know, a restaurant could go extinct, or uh, maybe the equivalent of a restaurant. Or a small firm who, who needs those uh, technical labor, which is, of course, uh, lowly paid. Okay, uh, uh, a couple of hands went up really quick when you started started talking about who will do the dishes. So um, uh, Andrea hasn't uh, spoken yet, so you first and then Benedict. Yeah, so um, I, to my hearing also, he said the dishes, because actually, a funny thing, like where I come from, they never teach us to like just study whatever you want. They teach us just study whatever we we'll put put in your place. Yeah. yeah. So if we had a UBI, maybe we would be studying different things. And with the dishes, um, my sister, she just studied um, psychology. So she's a psychologist. But when she moved to Ireland for a year off, she worked in cleaning services, and she loved it. And she always felt like. Now she works as a psychologist and everything, and she loves helping people, but she misses the job where she was cleaning buildings because she said it was relaxing for her and she didn't have to talk to anyone. It was just her and like desk and stuff. So there are people who generally enjoy those kind of jobs and who, if they have the opportunity to choose what to do instead of what, like for passion and for, for, for being more comfortable, there will be people, even maybe for us it's not like the best job, but for some others, they, that's a good job. So there will be people doing those kind of jobs that, for, that, that we don't find very enjoyable. Okay. Right, yeah. okay, I think you made your point. Uh, Benedict? I, I would also, like adding to that, um, I would also make the case that people in part-time, like the number of people in part-time employment would soar uh, instead of going down because uh, people may take a part-time job, like I do dishes personally, that's a personal choice then. Uh, people would just take part-time jobs in order to be able to afford the luxuries they want to afford. I don't think there is any, there is any reason to assume that part-time, like that part-time jobs will go extinct. Yeah. Absolutely not. It, if anything, more people would take part-time jobs because you can sort of, uh, you don't need to work 40 hours a week in order to afford basic living and a little bit of luxuries. You have the basic stuff hopefully covered, and then you uh, you work 20 hours because that's all you need for the luxuries. Yeah. 
Okay. In my case, that would be traveling, for example. I don't know. Also, I think the main question is not uh, there won't be people to wash the dishes. The main question would be then, are those people being paid enough? Yeah. Not, so, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Gritan wants to respond. So back to Gritan. Otto is waiting patiently, but, <laughs> but he's going to talk about another issue. So Gritan. Okay, so... <laughs> Yeah, I definitely anticipate that somebody would say that. Even when I was talking, I was thinking of it. But the thing is, uh, they would work to stay on the same difference curve uh, than they previously were. I mean, a UBI in a part-time job would put them in a uh, same condition as they worked uh, in a full-time job. Let's say, let's suppose that's the case. But at the same time, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to choose to work full-time. So... Uh, I definitely see a paradigm shift and a, a displacement of the economy as we know. So we aren't talk, when we talk about automatization, we're not talking about uh, that there won't be any jobs for humans, but we are talking for displacement of jobs. So I definitely see that the labor market would shift into, I don't know in which direction, but there, but that, but there will definitely be a change. I mean, there could, be, I, I, I do dishes myself and I don't have a problem with that, but uh, I, I think there are only a small group of people who could see them as, uh, you know, as a pastime, doing the dishes as a pastime. I think that's more as a, as a necessity at least as we, uh, at least speaking from the point of view of the status quo. So that's it from my side. Okay, uh, Fabian? Yeah, like I have two points to make to like what you just said. First of all, would a change of the current system be inherently bad? Like changing the status quo, what does it mean? Like it can have positive and negative outcomes. So like, and secondly, like when we talk about dishwashing as an example and how UBI would kill the dishwasher industry or not, <laughs> it goes back into like social stigmatization of certain positions in society and the UBI would definitely be a solution to this in a certain way. Because mostly social stigmatization goes back to people not earning enough to sustain themselves on their wages. And now we have, like, now there's the UBI, and someone is like, oh, yeah, I'm still washing dishes, so what? So they're like, oh, yeah, like, this person is a dishwasher, like, like, you know, work in the restaurant, do the dishes, and, but, like, it loses, like, the negative connotation that most societies put onto that job. So, like, it's also, like, a verification of that person in a different sense, like, using the year here with the different sorts of capital, not only is the economic capital of that person rising through like having a UBI, also the social capital is rising, meaning the person gains a different stance of society, just like as a consequence. Okay, Gritan? Okay, um, I didn't mean to uh, talk about dishwashing industry in a some sort of bad way. That's first of all. And I didn't stigmatize people uh, for working in that uh, industry or for doing that, those tasks. And you, the first, your first question was that whether, there, whether a change or a paradig paradigm change will be inherently a bad thing. Well, I don't necessarily think that, the, that that is a bad thing. And I think that change is neither good or bad. It simply is. But we have to know some sort of, uh, we have to have some sort of normative uh, goal by which we are trying to, to reach. And there are many alternative policies that could help us reach the same conclusions as, as you were implying, other than UBI. Well, I, I definitely like UBI myself, but there are a couple of, uh, questions that I that I think of when 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 we talk about UBI and we definitely have to know the responsibility that policymakers uh, have when they uh, pass such a such a legislation I mean would it be ethical if we shoot up inflation up to some point that is uncontrollable our UBI would inflate away 
And that would definitely be the case with the extremely expensive UBI, or as Hoynes and Rothstein uh, imply, they, their canonical UBI that is on top of every other program, uh, as far as I'm concerned. So I, I didn't mean to stigmatize those people, and I definitely think that UBI would reduce stigma, or at least, uh, uh, yeah, would definitely reduce stigma. So sorry for any uh, confusions. Oh, okay, yeah, well, what I, um, uh, what, what I want to uh, make sure you're, you're not saying here, uh, uh, Triton, is it sounds, it sounds like you're saying, well, it's a good thing we have these really poor people who are in this worker star position, because then we can get our, we, we can get our dishes washed or it's really cheap. Uh, you know, that's not a good thing. Um, I, I know some very rich people who throughout their lives have never had to wash dish and go and fly on their jet out to Vail to do, uh, fly on their jet out to Vail to go skiing and on the way, this is made for them, that is made for them, the other thing is made for them by people who are very much disrespected. Um, and all these things are made for them and they never have to reciprocate by washing dishes and cleaning toilets and doing these other things themselves. Um, and what I want, I think that if the rest of us need to decide, uh, do we want, it, 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 now that we're all free in, in the sense that we have the power to say no to doing stuff, crap that uh, people have been making us do for centuries, how badly do we want our dishes washed? Do we do it enough to give good wages, working conditions and respect? to the people to do it, or are we just gonna wash our own damn, damn dishes? Either way is fine with me. Uh, so I think that is the exact right incentive, is if you know, nobody wants to wash any dishes anymore, is the exact kind of incentive we need to make the rest of the people think about, well, how much do I wanna pay to get my dishes washed? Okay, let's go to Otto. Oh, okay, no, okay, you can, re you can reply to your time uh, before we go to Otto. Or that nobody misunderstands. Only fair. You, you can have the last word again. So I, I'm not saying that it's good that we have people uh, who do, let's say, uh, who work in inhumane yeah. conditions. I, I'm not saying that. I never, I never said that, and I, and I hope I didn't imply that. But I was uh, simply raising the question that who will do a particular job who isn't paid well enough, and uh, inherently uh, has let's say not well uh, or not very good conditions. So I was just asking some way, I was implying my question that who will do a certain task? There is a new UBI history. There is somebody who made that very comment and his name was, was uh, uh, Russell Long. He was a senator from, he was a senator from Louisiana who's actually his, Actually, his, his uncle or his, his older brother actually proposed Base Kinka back in the 1930s. But in the 1970s, when he was representing a very conservative Louisiana in the Senate, and this issue came up, he said, if we introduce this guaranteed income, who's going to iron my shirts? I said, notice my shirt is not ironed. You see the wrinkles here? <laughs> um, I'm like, Russell Long, you, you, want, you know, iron your own damn shirts or, or leave and go, you know. Um, and uh, or pay enough that people want to, you know. So it's really Russell Long that I was going after there, not not you. Okay, um, okay, uh, Otto, you're next. Uh, thank you. Well, um, I had two questions, but I believe I'll limit myself to one for the sake of time. And um, and to um, so my my question is really going back to the issue of um, the normative foundations of of your theory being heavily tied to resource ownership and, and who controls resources is normatively significant. And what is wrong about the current system is the, is the unfair uh, distribution of resource ownership, which of course ties very heavily into the left libertarian side of argumentation. But where your um, version of it, I think, um, differs from some of the other ones and which I have kind of an empirical problem with perhaps, although I agree with 80% of, of what you say, um, and I rarely agree with anyone on that level, <laughs> but, um, but this is the question I have for you, because you seem to argue that, um, 
the that the current structure of wealth accumulation and um, and um, resource allocation is heavily controlled uh, or tied to the um, the the sort of the resource owners making decisions, controlling wealth, um, controlling the industry. And you know, the, to a large extent that might be true, but I think this is an empirical question, isn't it? To what extent we can analyze the existing wealth and, and so on as, as being tied to, to, to resources as the base, right? So you, you argue that passive income from capital uh, is perhaps the dominant form of resource ownership in the capitalist society. You know, this suggests that the problem is rentier capitalism of the sort that Thomas Piketty, for example, famously analyzes in his works. Um, but you know, to what extent is this so? I mean, most economists would say that wealth has multiple sources, and even though they're all mixed at the moment, um, you know, they're mixed in the sense that basically every capital investment uh, must ultimately also appeal to the interests of the resource owners, as you call them. But um, but is it really so that you know it's best to analyze the wealth of people like Elon Musk as being tied to resource ownership? To what extent can we? differentiate between um, wealth that derives from innovative business uh, ideas, um, from talent, from labor, and to what extent should we do so normatively based on your own analysis? Um, uh, if effective self-control, self-ownership or independentarian freedom um, is, is heavily tied to resource ownership, and if we can satisfy conditions of effective control, self-ownership to everybody, um, based on a targeted taxation and redistribution uh, that exclusively targets resource ownership and is capable of doing so by identifying the, the main, main sources of, of resource control. Is there any remaining independentarian case for taxing income or wealth inequalities that derive from other sources, might be called more innocent sources, if you will, such as talents, labor, or ideas? All right, that, uh, it was a good thing you're last. Well, actually, uh, Maria is supposed to get a chance to say something, so I guess you're not last. But, uh, because um, that's a perfect question for me to answer. That's what next Friday's topic is all about, where I talk about independentarian property theory. Um, so actually, I will spend really uh, the whole hour um, uh, on Friday, uh, starting at starting at three o'clock, uh, talking about my answer to your question, Otto. So, uh, so I'll put that one off till next time. Uh, okay. Um, but uh, but so there's a teaser for next time. And uh, Maria, um, you were also discussing the uh, this one. Do you do you have uh, uh, something to add here? Oh, yes, I have read this book and I really like this book. Oh, and cool. I'm in really favor of uh, this uh, basic income because it can lift the people of their uh, situation, actual situation where, where they are not able to earn more. And by this additional support, I think they can get lift up. And for example, if the people, they are due to some reason, they were lack of some education and they were not able to make it properly to get a really good job. If they get a, uh, support from the basic income, and then they can say no to any lower job, and then they can get some certification and make their self more better to participate in uh, in a society in a better way. Does uh, anybody want to respond to that, or should we let Maria get the last word? In? All right. I think Maria, you have the final word. I will see you all Wednesday.